Welcome to Orbital Dynamics, part 25. In part 23, I talked about Feynman's last lecture, where he described how Newton derived Kepler's three laws geometrically. In this part, I'm going to derive Kepler's three laws algebraically. In 1543, Copernicus published his famous book that asserted that the sun was at the center of the solar system. A generation later, Kepler formulated his three laws, and then 150 years after Copernicus's book, Isaac Newton took Kepler's third law and used it to deduce the law of universal gravitation. From the law of gravitation and his dynamics, Newton was able to deduce Kepler's other two laws. Newton's derivation characterizes other kinds of orbital motion that Kepler's laws didn't predict. Deducing Kepler's laws from Newton's is called the Kepler problem. In part 23 on Feynman's last lecture, I did this geometrically. Here, I'll do it algebraically. Before I tackle the Kepler problem, I need to define what I'm calling polar coordinate unit vectors. I'll start with the Cartesian unit vectors. The I unit vector goes along the X axis, the J unit vector goes along the Y axis, and the K unit vector goes along the Z axis. The circle with the dot at its center is supposed to be an arrow pointing at you. To define unit vectors for polar coordinates, I want to start with the position vector R. Here's its length. The emboldened R is a vector. The italicized R is the scalar length. R points in a direction defined by the angle theta between R and the x-axis. This is the magnitude of the vector R, the scalar length. And the vector R equals the scalar R times the unit vector R. And thus, the unit vector R equals the vector R divided by the scalar R. Here are the transformations back to the xy Cartesian coordinate system. The x component of r is r cosine theta times the unit vector i. x is a vector here. The y component of r is r sine theta times the unit vector j. r thus equals r cosine theta times the unit vector i plus r sine theta times the unit vector j. And I'm leaving out z because orbits in the Keplerian sense are two-dimensional. I can factor out the scalar r from both terms, and if I divide both sides by the scalar r, I get a formula for the unit vector r, and it equals cosine theta i plus sine theta j. Here's the unit vector r. I could have drawn this anywhere. I chose to draw it at the tip of the position vector. It would have been more correct to draw it from the origin, but it makes this makes it more intuitive. I'll now introduce the unit vector theta that I intend to have be orthogonal to the unit vector r. I need a formula for that. I'll take the derivative of r with respect to theta, and we'll define that to be the unit vector theta. Now, it's going to be orthogonal to r, or at right angles to r. I'm going to assert that this unit vector is, and I'll prove that later. The derivative of r with respect to theta is dr d theta, and it equals dd theta of cosine theta i plus sine theta j. The derivative of a sum is the sum of derivatives, so I can express this as cosine theta d theta plus sine theta d theta. The i and j unit vectors are constants, so they're not part of the derivative. The derivative of cosine theta is minus sine theta. The derivative of sine theta is cosine theta. This thus equals the unit vector theta. Now I'll prove that the, this unit vector theta is orthogonal to the unit vector r. If they're perpendicular, then their dot product would equal zero. Here's the dot product. a dot b plus c equals a dot b plus a dot c. So if I multiply these two terms, it expands out to this. i and j are orthogonal, so this term is 0, and the same holds for this dot product. The dot product of two vectors, a and b, is the scalar a times the scalar b times the cosine of the angle between the two. And don't confuse this theta with the theta I'm referring to below for the unit vector theta. If a and b are collinear, then theta equals 0, which means cosine of theta is 1. And the dot product, then, in that case, is simply a times b. These two terms are collinear, as are these two terms. So I can reduce this equation to minus cosine theta sine theta plus sine theta cosine theta, and that equals 0. Hence, the unit vector theta is orthogonal to the unit vector r. I now want to take the derivative of the theta unit vector with respect to theta. That's minus sine theta i plus cosine theta j d theta. Again, the derivative of a sum is the sum of derivatives. The derivative of sine is cosine. 
and the derivative of, of cosine is minus sine, and this less equals minus r. And I'm going to use that um, this equality later. In orbital dynamics, r and theta vary over time, so now I want to take the derivative of both r and theta with respect to time. Here's the derivative of unit vector r with respect to time, d unit r dt. According to the chain rule, dr dt equals dr d theta times d theta dt. I said before that dr d theta equals the unit vector theta, so d unit r dt equals d theta dt times unit theta. And that's as far as I'll go with the derivation. I'm going to use this quality later. Here's the derivative of theta with respect to time, d unit theta dt. According to the chain rule, d theta dt equals d theta d theta d theta, I'm sorry, d unit theta d theta times d theta dt. And because d unit theta d theta equals minus r, that equals minus r d theta dt. Here's the same formula in reverse, and if I divide both sides of this equation by d theta dt, I get that minus r equals 1 over d theta dt times d theta dt. And that's as far as I'll go with this derivation. I'll also use this later. The unit vectors r and theta share a property with i and j. i cross j equals k. k is normal to both i and j. And r cross theta is also equal to k. So with these polar coordinate unit vectors, I didn't have a vector in the third dimension. In this case, I would use k. Now I want to say a bit more about unit r and unit theta. The change in the scalar r over time is known as the radial component of velocity. In the last part, I talked about linear forces and torque. The radial component is a result of a linear force. For an orbiting body modeled in an elliptical orbit, the gravitational force comes from a fixed central body. That means that the radial component is along the unit vector r. The transverse component is a change in angle over time. If you multiply that by the distance r, you get torque. It's multiplied by the unit vector theta because torque is only caused by a force that acts on the unit vector orthogonally. Now I have all the equalities that I need. Now I'll get into the Kepler problem. Recall that I expressed Kepler's second law as the change in area over the change in time, and that it was constant for a body that's orbiting around a massive central body, like um, the Earth orbiting around the Sun. In a previous part, I determined that the area dA was equal to 1 half times the cross product of the position vector r and the velocity vector v. In a previous part, I showed you that for uniform circular motion, 1 half r cross v equals L, the angular momentum, divided by 2 times the mass of the orbiting body, little m. Previously, I showed you dynamics for uniform circular motion. Orbits are elliptical, so here's an ellipse. Here's the velocity vector of, the, of an object in an elliptical orbit. And notice that it's not aligned with the unit vector um, theta. Theta is orthogonal to r, and velocity is tangential to the point on the ellipse. Velocity is the change in position over time. The velocity vector is dr dt, where r is the position vector. That equals d dt of the scalar r times the unit vector r. The product rule for derivatives says that d ab dx equals a db dx plus b dA dx. Since both scalar r and unit r change with time, I'll apply the product rule. V less equals the r dt times unit r plus scalar r times d unit r dt. Recall that d unit r dt equals d theta dt times unit theta. I'll make that substitution here. Now I'll go back to r cross v. That equals scalar r times unit r cross d r dt unit r plus scalar r d theta dt times unit theta. A cross B plus C equals A cross B plus A cross C. That's a fundamental equality for cross products. R cross V thus equals scalar R times unit R cross dr dt times unit R plus scalar R times unit R cross r d theta dt times unit theta. With cross products, you can express A times the vector x cross B times the vector y as AB times x cross y. Here I factor out the scalars. r cross v now equals r dr dt times unit r cross unit r plus r squared times d theta dt times unit r cross unit theta. The cross product of a vector with itself is zero. 
So this term r cross r equals zero. I said before that unit r cross unit theta is unit k. This term thus equals unit k. r cross v is that thus equals r squared d theta dt times unit k. This makes some intuitive sense. I said before the one half r cross v equals l over 2m. The angular momentum l aligns with the unit vector k. r cross v must then align with the unit vector k. Now, if I start with l over 2m times 1 half r cross v and then multiply both sides by 2m, I get that l, the angular momentum, equals mr cross v. I can substitute r squared d theta dt times unit k for r cross v, and I get that l equals m times r squared times d theta dt times the unit vector k. So let's examine this equation. The angular momentum vector is normal to the orbital plane, so it makes sense that it aligns with the unit vector k. Angular momentum is proportional to mass m, so it makes sense that mass m shows up, shows up on the right-hand side of this equation. The angular momentum is proportional to the distance from the center of mass squared. This is consistent with Newton's law of gravitation. And the angular momentum is a function of the change in theta over time, d theta dt. You recall in a previous part about when I talked about torque, if d theta dt is characterized as a force, it would result in a torque that would cause a rotation of the position vector around the central body. That hypothetical torque would be r cross f. And if you factor in mass, it would also represent the angular momentum. r cross v for orbital motion is somewhat analogous to torque. If I change this from a vector equation to a scalar equation, I get rid of the unit vector k and change l to a scalar. The magnitude of the angular momentum is m times r squared d theta dt. And let's express this equation as L over M times R squared d theta dt. And I'll use this equation later. An orbiting planet is acted on by gravitational force from a central body in a system like our solar system. Because there's no external torque on the two-body system, angular momentum is conserved. This implies that L is constant, and hence L over 2m must be constant. The mass of the orbiting body does not change. d a d t is, is a vector, and because it too is constant, it has constant magnitude and constant direction. Constant magnitude implies Kepler's second law, equal error and equal time. Constant direction implies Kepler's first part of Kepler's first law, that the orbit lies in a plane, and that the plane is perpendicular to the direction of the vector that's normal to, normal to the orbital plane. Assume there was a fixed central body of mass m0 and a moving body of mass m attracted to the central body by a gravitational force f. This is Newton's law of gravitation in vector form. Note that the force is negative and is along the position unit vector, position unit, vector unit r. Newton's second law relates force, mass, and acceleration. Rather than using f equals ma, here f equals the mass m times the change in the velocity dv dt. dv dt and a are synonymous. With orbital motion, acceleration is due to the gravitational force. If I equate the two force equation, then m dv dt equals gm m0 over r squared times the unit vector r. Little m is on both sides of this equation, so this reduces to dv dt equals minus gm0 over r squared times the unit vector r. I can express this equation as dv dt equals g times m0 over r squared times minus unit r. I determined two slides ago that minus unit r equals 1 over d theta dt times d unit theta dt. I'll make that substitution. DV, dv dt now equals g times m0 over r squared d theta dt times d unit theta dt. On the previous slide, I showed you that l over m equals r squared d theta dt dv dt thus equals g times m0 over l over m times d unit theta dt. I'll move l over m from the denominator to the numerator. That becomes gm m0 over l times d unit theta dt. Now I'll divide both sides of this equation by gm m0 over l. That results in l over gm m0 times dv dt equals d unit theta dt. The change in velocity over time, dv dt, is proportional to the change in unit theta over time. Remember that I said that the theta vector and the velocity vector were not aligned. Velocity is tangential to the direction of motion along the ellipse. Theta is orthogonal to the position vector r. Uh, 
These two vectors only align in two places, apoapsis and periapsis. The vectors v and unit of theta hence are not equal, both in magnitude and direction. The derivatives of each of these vectors, v and theta, do result in vectors that are co-aligned, however. That's what this equation implies. The constant proportionality for dvdt and d unit theta is L over gm m0. Now I'll take the integral of this function that will convert that will convert this from a differential equation to a simple vector equation. I'm taking the integral of a derivative. If I take the integral with respect to y of dx dy, that equals x plus a constant c. This is one of the fundamental theorems of calculus that both Leibniz and Newton figured out. The integral of a derivative is the underlying function. With the integral form of the fundamental theorem, you have to add in a constant c. If you go the other way and take the derivative of x plus a constant c with respect to y, it's simply dx dy, since the derivative of constant dc dv is 0. Hence, the integral of this function is L over gm m0 v, and that equals the unit vector theta plus a constant vector c. It's important to know that c is a vector. I said previously that the v and unit theta are not co-aligned. C thus has to be a vector so that unit theta plus c equals some constant times v. I mentioned before that v and theta are only co-aligned at two points. I can derive c by evaluating v and theta at one of, those, one of these points. In fact, let's define one of those points as our starting point when time t equals 0. Let's define it when the orbiting body is at periapsis, closest to the focal point. At t equals 0, dr dt equals 0 because r is at a minimum. Remember the derivatives are synonymous with a slope function. If the function reaches a minimum, the slope crosses through 0 at the minimum point. The velocity vector at the t equals 0 point is co-aligned with the unit vector theta. The unit vector theta at t equals 0 is co-aligned with j, the unit vector along the y-axis, and because they are both unit vectors, we can say they are equal. Let's then express c with the Cartesian unit vector j rather than the polar coordinate unit vector theta. c is not a unit vector, so it would equal some scalar times the unit vector j. Let's pick e for that scalar. The velocity equation becomes L over gm m0 times v equals the unit vector theta plus e times j. If I take the dot product of theta on both sides, I get this equation. Remember that a dot b equals the scalar magnitude of a times the scalar magnitude of v times the cosine of the angle between them, theta. If I take the dot product of a unit vector with itself, it equals the scalar magnitude squared. The angle between the same unit vector is 0 and the cosine of 0 is 1. Since a here is a unit vector, the scalar magnitude is 1. So unit a dot unit a equals 1. Unit theta dot unit theta is thus equal to 1. In the second term, the magnitude of the unit vector j and the unit vector theta are both 1. The angle between them is theta, so that's 1 times 1 cosine theta. I'm left with um, e times 1 plus e times cosine theta. That results in this equation, L over G mm0 dot theta equals 1 plus e cosine theta. On the previous slide, I derived this equation for V. I said that dr dt was equal to 0 at time t. The first term thus equals 0. V thus equals r d theta dt times the unit vector theta. If I take the dot product of unit theta on both sides, V dot theta is equal to r d theta dt times the dot product of unit theta dot unit theta. Unit theta dot unit theta equals 1, so this equals r d theta dt. Let's multiply that by r over r. I get 1 over r r squared d theta dt. Why did I just do this? Look at the last part of this equation, r squared d theta dt. I previously said that that equals L over m. So I can make that substitution. v dot unit theta equals 1 over r times L over m. I can make that substitution here. And if I combine terms, I get L squared over gm squared m0 equals r times 1 plus e cosine theta. Solving for r gives me L squared over gm m squared m0 times 1 plus e cosine theta. r is at a minimum when theta equals 0, which is the periapsis point. Likewise, r is at a maximum when theta equals pi radians. In the equation for r, theta is the only variable. Everything else is a constant. I'm now going to prove that e must be a positive number. 1 over 1 plus e cosine theta must be greater than 1 over 1 plus 
e cosine zero because r is at a maximum when theta equals pi and at a minimum when theta equals zero. Cosine pi is minus one, cosine zero is one. So one over one plus e is greater than one over one minus e. I can flip the equations and change the greater than sign to less than. Minus e is less than plus e, that's intuitive. If I were to add e to both sides and switch the order, you'd get that two e is greater than zero. Divide that by two and I get that e is greater than zero. I'm going to show you another vPython animation that um, demonstrates the dynamics with these um, radial transfers uh, components of velocity. Before I do that, I need to show you how to determine those radial transfers vectors. Prior derivations I did with, with uniform circular motion. So in that case, this would be the velocity vector, and this is the transverse unit vector, theta hat, and this is the radial unit vector, r hat. The velocity in this case is all transverse. The radial or parallel component of um, velocity is zero. If it weren't, the motion wouldn't follow a circle of fixed circumference. So I want to go back to the ellipse and enlarge the vectors. Here's a velocity vector. And notice that it's not aligned with either the, the transverse or radial unit vector. The radial or parallel component of this velocity vector is the projection of the velocity vector on the unit, um, our unit vector. And it would be this vector. You remember that the dot product of A and B is AB cosine theta. One of the properties dot products have is that if you multiply them by C1 and C2, um, if you multiply C1, C2 by A dot B, it equals C1, A dot C2, B. And C2 could equal 1. Um, so you're just left with C1. So that means that A dot B divided by the scalar B equals A times the cosine of theta. Since the vector b over the scalar b equals the unit vector b, this reduces to a dot b hat equals a cosine theta. And this is the vector projection of v on the vector r hat. Hence, v parallel equals v dot r hat. Now, this is a scalar quantity. So in order to make this a vector, I need to multiply the scalar v parallel times unit vector r. And that means that v parallel equals r hat times v dot r hat. The transverse component of V is the projection of V on theta hat, and it's the purple vector. And that's easy to compute. It's V minus V parallel. Here. And you'll recall that the angular momentum is R cross MV. And I'll use these three formulas in the Python code I'm about to show you. Um, to be consistent, I would have multiplied V parallel and V perpendicular by M, so they'd be momentums and they would be Ps. Um, L, as I said, is angular momentum, and it is M times B. But for the animation I'm going to show you, I didn't do that. Um, the momentum vectors and the velocity vectors point in the same direction, and I had to scale them up anyway in the code to make them readable. So I didn't multiply by M. Okay, I want to go back to the three body or the, the solar system n body code that I showed you in a previous part. And you recall this used um, Newton's force equation to model the orbits of a solar system. And I'll just run this to remind you what it looks like. All right, if I zoom in, you can see the inner planets of the solar system. All right, but in this case, I want to make this a two-body system of just the Earth and the Sun. So I've got the Sun. I'm going to delete Mercury and Venus and all the other planets beyond Earth. And I'm going to reduce this planet list to just Earth and Sun. And I don't need the um, vector annotations in this simulation. And I'm going to change these scale factors so that um, the planets and the vectors aren't huge. So now this is just the Earth orbiting the Sun. This isn't a perfectly circular orbit, but as you know, Earth's got extremely low eccentricity, so it's nearly circular. And I have a velocity vector and a force vector in the red and green. <clears throat> 
Okay, now I want to add the radial and transverse vectors for the sun. There's, and I have radial vectors as well as radial arrows. And radial and transverse vectors for the Earth. I put them both in here for completeness. I'm only going to display the Earth radial and transverse vectors. And here, as the simulation runs, I'm going to update the radial. There's um, r hat times uh, r hat dot uh, v hat v. So that's the radial component of velocity. The transverse component is just v minus uh, v radial. Pretty simple in v Python. And then here I'm just changing the position of the arrows and the uh, length of the arrows. And I have to scale them up by 3e6 so you can see them, otherwise they're very small. And I'll make that consistent. All right, so now velocity, radial, transverse, they're all scaled by the same factor. Now here, um, velocity and uh, transverse is co-aligned. Oh, and this is almost circular motion. And they pretty much remain co-aligned. They're slightly off, but they are remain co-aligned. All right, I want to increase the animation rate because that ran a little bit slow. And here I want to make the Earth orbit elliptical, so I'm just going to take the Earth initial velocity vector and multiply it by 1.25. And with that extra velocity, I get an elliptical orbit. And now you can see the orange vectors is the radial and transverse component of the red velocity vector. And again, if I multiply these by m, I would get momentums. But you can see it just co-lined at apoapsis. Now they're separate. They're going to co-align at periapsis. And then notice the velocity, the radial component of velocity points outward as the planet goes to apoapsis and then points inward as it travels toward periapsis. And that makes intuitive sense because the planet's going to get closer to the sun at periapsis or perihelion and farther away at apoapsis or aphelion. All right, so that's how radial and transverse components work. And now I want to bring back angular momentum. So I, I don't want to do this with respect to the center of mass. In the n-body system, I had to show you that there was a conservation of angular momentum for the entire system. In this case, with a large central body and a small Earth, there's nearly conservation of angular momentum. Kepler thought, well, Kepler didn't know about this, but in Kepler's geometry, there is, although in reality, there really, really isn't. All right, and I'm going to scale um, the Earth angular momentum axis by 10 to the 30th. Otherwise, the arrow is really small. So here, this is normal to the orbital plane. And you can see, despite the fact that there's a change in velocity in both magnitude and direction. Angular momentum is conserved. So the transverse component of velocity times the mass times the unit vector r is the angular momentum. And you can see when r gets small, the transverse velocity is big. When r gets large, transfer, transverse velocity is small. And it's always equal. Hence, there's a conservation of angular momentum. OK, I want to compare this equation um, to the one I derived a while ago, the equation for polar coordinates for an ellipse. Um, there are equaled a times 1 minus e squared over 1 plus e cosine theta. Um, let's express the equation for r this way, and let's say that L squared over GMM squared M0 equals A times minus 1 E squared. The equation for r becomes the equation for an ellipse. Hence, our equation L squared over GMM squared M0 times 1 plus E cosine theta results in an ellipse. And this 
hence um, solves one part of the Kepler problem, that planets orbit along an ellipse. Now, this only holds for a very small body orbiting a very massive and hypothetically fixed central body. So this only works for those kinds of two-body systems. And we call systems like these Keplerian systems, which the model is a simplification, but it works to a remarkable degree. I said that E to the eccentricity is greater than zero, but it could be equal to zero. R at periapsis is the same as R at apoapsis. Um, let's consider the case where E equals zero. If I substitute zero for E in this equation, it results in this. In the denominator, zero times cosine theta is zero, and one plus zero is one. R thus equals R squared um, over GM M squared M zero. Here I'm getting rid of the one in parentheses. If R is a constant, no matter what the value of theta, it results in ellipse with a constant radius, which is a circle. The angular momentum L is constant. The gravitational constant G is constant. The mass of the orbiting body M is constant. And the mass of the central body M0 is also constant. So if V equals zero, R is thus a constant circular radius. And this is uniform circular motion. Now let's consider the case where E equals one. If I substitute one for E in this equation, it results in this. Here R, the length, uh, the position vector will vary over theta. I said before that for an ellipse, R is at a minimum when theta is zero and it's at a maximum when theta is pi radians. Our minimum would thus be this formula where I plugged in theta equals zero. Cosine of zero is one, which results in this formula. R max is this formula where I plugged in theta equals pi. Cosine pi is minus one. One minus one is zero, and I'm dividing by zero. That implies that R max goes to infinity. This equation, this, is, this equation describes a parabola. It's as if when the eccentricity hit one, the orbital path opened up. It's no longer closed orbit. A body in motion around the central massive body that travels along this trajectory will alter course along this parabolic path and then will head out to infinity. And it makes one pass. That's what the formula for R max predicts. This is one of Newton's discoveries when he solved the Kepler problem. It was a trajectory that Kepler didn't predict. If the eccentricity is greater than one, this equation defines an open path like a parabola. That's because E times cosine theta equals minus one for a value of theta that is less than pi. In fact, if E is greater than one, the formula for R results in a hyperbolic path. Like a parabola, R has a minimum when theta equals zero, but goes infinite when theta equals that number where cosine theta equals minus one. The shapes I've just described, the circle, ellipse, parabola, and hyperbola, are all in a class of figures called conic sections. These shapes can be characterized as the intersection of a dual cone with a plane. If the cutting plane is level, you get a circle. This is what results if we specify an eccentricity of zero in this equation. If the cutting plane is tilted, you get an ellipse. Here, the eccentricity is less than one and greater than zero. If the cutting plane is parallel to the sides of the cones, you get a parabola. Here, the eccentricity equals one. And if the cutting plane is vertical, you get a hyperbola. Here, the eccentricity is greater than one. And in the conic section, you get two hyperbolas. The planet only orbits along one of them. I want to show you some geometric constructions for these um, conic sections, and I'll start with one that uses focus points. So this is a circle, and PF1 equals PF2. This is the distance from the focus point to the point P. This is an ellipse where PF1 plus PF2 is a constant. And then if I take the focus point out from within the shape, I get a hyperbola. And here the absolute value of P of one minus P of two is a constant. Now, I can't use this construction to make a parabola. Um, I just end up with a really flat ellipse. So there's some lim limitations of this geometric con construct. The way to construct a parabola is to draw a horizontal line, which is called the directics, 
um, put a point P, put a point Q on it, um, draw a perpendicular line up uh, to a point P, and then define a focus point and draw a line from the focus point to the point P. And all points that are All points where the ratio FP over QP equals 1 defines the parabola, which means FP equals QP. And so that's the way to construct a, hyper, a uh, parabola. I can use the same method to define an ellipse. And here the ratio of FP and QP is constant, but the values are different. So every case where FP over QP is constant and the values are allowed to vary uh, defines an ellipse. And I can change the shape by moving the directrix line. Here is a similar method to define a hyperbola. Notice again the ratio of FP over QP is constant. And here I'll change the shape of the hyperbola. The ratio of FP over QP changes, but as I move the point around, it stays constant. Notice too that this ratio of FP over QP is greater than 1. In the, ratios I, in the ratios I showed you, FP divided by QP um, were the eccentricities of the um, circle, ellipse, parabola, and hyperbola. And you'll recall in previous parts, I went through a long derivation to determine an equation of polar coordinates for an ellipse with the focus of the origin. With this method, that derivation is not only much simpler, but it results in an equation of polar coordinates for all the conic sections. So note the distance d between the focus and the directrix. I can express the first equation as fp equals eqp. r is the length from f to p, and that means that r equals e times qp. Theta is the angle fp makes with the x-axis, hence qp equals d minus r cosine theta. And that's what I'm showing here. The projection on the x-axis from f to p is r cosine theta. The distance from f to the directrix is d. If I take away the line segment r cosine theta from the segment d, I'm left with the length of qp. Thus, r equals e times d minus r cosine theta. I can multiply e times d and times r cosine theta. I can then add e r cosine theta to both sides of this equation. Factoring out the r gives me r times 1 plus e cosine theta. And then dividing both sides by 1 plus e cosine theta gives me r equals e d divide by 1 plus e cosine theta. And because cosine theta equals cosine minus theta, this formula is symmetric about the x-axis. For an ellipse, the distance um, fp from the focus point on the curve is always less than the point on the curve and the point q on the directrix. That implies that fp over qp is less than 1 and fp over qp equals e, and that implies that e is between 0 and 1. The curve crosses the horizontal axis at two points, where theta equals 0 and where theta equals pi. For a, par for a parabola, fp equals qp. fp over qp thus equals 1, which equals e. When e equals 1, the equation for r reduces this. r equals d over 1 plus cosine theta. Here, the distance from f to the vertex v is the same as the distance from the vertex to the directrix. Like the ellipse, when theta equals 0, the curve crosses the horizontal x-axis. When theta equals pi, however, the equation for r is d over 1 plus cosine pi. Cosine of pi is minus 1, so r equals d divided by 0, which equals infinity. And this curve spreads out to an arbitrary large distance from the axis as theta increases towards pi. Intuitively, you might think that theta can never approach pi, uh, 
a parabola is a special case where theta, as theta approaches pi, the point p goes out to infinity. The farther and farther p goes out, the closer and closer the line segment approaches the x-axis. For a hyperbola, f is greater than qp. For every point on the curve, the distance from f to p is greater than the distance from p to q. fp over qp is thus greater than 1, which equals e. Again, when theta equals 0, r crosses the horizontal x-axis. To show where this function diverges, let's divide the numerator and denominator by e. That results in r equaling d over 1 um, over e plus cosine theta. When the cosine theta equals minus 1 over e, the denominator of the previous equation will be 0, and r will be affinity. Specifically, this is when theta equals the r cosine of minus 1 over e. With a parabola, theta can approach pi. Hyperbola has asymptotes where um, theta approaches the r cosine of minus 1 over e, the eccentricity. And because theta can approach pi, parabolas don't have asymptotes. One final derivation that revisits one I did previously, r at periapsis is ed over 1 plus e cosine 0, and r at apoapsis is ed over 1 plus e cosine pi. Cosine 0 is 1, so r at periapsis equals ed over 1 plus e. The cosine of pi is minus 1, so r at apoapsis is ed over 1 minus e. The semi-major axis of the ellipse is half the distance between r at periapsis and r at apoapsis. R at periapsis plus R at apoapsis, apoapsis is ED over 1 plus E plus ED over 1 minus E. If I multiply the first time term by 1 minus E over 1 minus E and the second term by 1 plus E over 1 plus E, I get ED times 1 minus E over 1 minus E squared plus ED times 1 plus E over 1 minus E squared. I can put all that over a common denominator and then multiply ED by 1 minus E and ED by uh, 1 plus e. The e squared d is canceled, and I'm left with two eds. I can make that substitution here. There's a 2 in the numerator and a 2 in the denominator, so I can also put 1 minus e squared in the denominator. That results in this equation, ed over 1 minus e squared. With this equation, I can solve for ed. That results in this equation, ed equals a times 1 minus e squared. If I make that substitution here, I have the formula for an ellipse based on theta. These interest the E and the semi-major axis A. This is the same equation I derived in a previous part. So some final words about the derivation of uh, the words for conic sections. An ellipse is a grammatical construction where an element in a sentence is omitted. Mathematically, this corresponds to E less than 1. A parable is a short story that makes some parallel to life. It corresponds to the shape form with a plane parallel to the cones. A hyperbole is an exaggeration or an overstatement. It corresponds to E being greater than 1. So the main takeaways here is this is how Newton um, related his uh, gravitational force equation um, that characterize the dynamics of orbiting bodies, and it's how he related it back to Kepler's laws. And when he found that based on his laws, he could derive Kepler's laws, he knew that what he was proposing was consistent.